straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. More eyewitness accounts and Israeli coalition talks. That's what we're going to be talking today about the show. Uh, Over the last 24 hours, another terror attack in the Sumerian region of Israel. There was a drive-by shooting by terrorists at the Tapuach Junction, which is north of Jerusalem, in which three yeshiva students who were sitting at a bus stop uh, were shot at a passing by a passing car. It's not known if it was one terrorist who was driving and then pulled out a gun and shot these students waiting at the bus stop, or if it was a driver and a shooter in the car. The uh, IDF is scouring and combing the area, looking for the terrorists. One is in very, very critical condition. The other one is a very uh, serious condition, and another one was uh, shot, but I believe he has already now been released home recently in the last few hours. We're also going to be looking at the death of 45 Israeli citizens and the large number of injured that's still fresh in the minds of the country from Thursday night's bottleneck crushing that took place on Mount Meron. We're asking ourselves how this major tragedy could have happened and what we need to do to prevent another tragic event like this. We're also doing a self-examination on the reason why this happened. We, I'm talking about on the spiritual level. We explore these topics today on the show and then take a look at the Israeli Knesset. You got to get practical too here. And uh, we're going to be looking at the seat of government in the Knesset, or non government, I should say. As after four elections inside of two years, we still have no new coalition. The wheeling and dealing is frantically going on with Prime Minister Netanyahu trying to keep his seat of power by attempting to get at least 61 Knesset members on his side. But opposition leader from the left center, Yair Lapid, is also trying. What will we see happen? We'll be right back. The return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel was prophesied in the Bible thousands of years ago and is coming true today. Shalom. Join me, Josh Wander, on Israel Unplugged. Listen in as we delve into the spiritual and physical aspects of the Jewish return to Zion. We'll discuss the biblically mandated, historic, and of course practical understandings of this incredible transition from exile to redemption. That's Israel Unplugged. Every Monday on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. All right, we're back here at the Tamar Yona Show on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Leah Aharoni is an INTR show host here. She hosts the show called News from the Torah, and she has a lot of hats that she wears, one of them being a tour guide. And she led a group of women up north the other day uh, near the Marone area, uh, on a quest to discover more about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, or the Rashbi, as we um, tenderly call him as well. And uh, she has some things that uh, she wants to share with us, because the question in Israel today still is, how could something like this have happened, and why? And do we need to do a what we call a cheshbon nefesh? Do we need to do some inner searching all of us, or you know, it's not just the blame game of it was the police, or it was the, uh, it was the government's fault, or it was the administrator's fault. We all have to look inside of us and ask ourselves why God 
uh, would have something like this happen. So welcome to the show, Leah Aharoni. Hello, Tamar. How are you? Uh, you know, like everyone else, and, and you know, we had the, the terrible sh- drive-by shooting yesterday on Sunday as well, so we're all reeling from that. And we, we all have to ask ourselves these questions. What is happening and why? So uh, thank you for the question, and I think we can look at it at two levels. We can look at the practical level, but then there is the inner level, the spiritual level, which is actually exactly well, the whole teaching of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is about, the whole teaching of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is about the fact that we need to look beyond the, the surface level, beyond the practicalities, and find God in everything. This is exactly what he teaches. And then when we find God in it, we need to fix whatever is happening on the practical level in a gradual way. This is exactly what his Torah is all about. So on the practical level, I think... We have a major problem. We have all these very special places connected to the different rabbis and the different sages of the Talmud, of the Mishnah, and even of the of the Bible. And they're tre- they're not really treated as sites of national heritage. You would expect that there would be a government office or a government entity or an official entity that would organize all of these places and invest in them and develop the infrastructure and and make them into the jewels of our national heritage. I don't think there's any other society, maybe besides the Greeks, who has sites that are uh, connected with their national heroes and uh, their national sages. We're, I think we're just about the only such, such, such society. Yet these places, if you visit them, if, the, if they're well taken, it's because there's a private body doing that, and many of them are really not well cared for. And certainly sites like Rabbi Shimon's um, grave, where close to a million people show up every year, maybe even more, and on Lagba Omer, which is his day of passing, three to 500,000 people show up every year, it has to be taken seriously. It has to be treated like a national heritage monument by the government and invested and developed properly. Instead, it is managed by a group of five people, and it's private property. So I think, just like the Kotel, which is a very holy site. It That's has, the Western Wall for anyone who doesn't that know. The Western Wall. It, you know, it has government funding. The government develops it. The government takes care of it, obviously. The same um, courtesy should be extended to every single holy site in Israel. And Rabbi Shimon is the next, is the next one up. Um, so this is definitely on the practical level. And I, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. Um, I think the government will figure out that this is not the time to look. It is the time to look for who is at fault, but that there has to be something beyond that on a more on a more macro level to develop the site in a way that can support all of these visitors. So that's practically. On the spiritual level, the entire the entire Torah of Rabbi Shimon is also connected to the idea of love between fellow men. Okay. Like Ba Omer, which is the day of Rabbi Shimon's passing and the day that we celebrate, is also a day when a plague among Rabbi Akiva's students ended. Rabbi Akiva had 24,000 students. Rabbi Akiva was Rabbi Shimon's teacher. He had 24,000 students. And they all died within one month during plague. And the Talmud says that they died because they would not show proper respect to each other. They would not give enough consideration to each other's ideas, and I think this is so, so relevant for our day today. Well, we have lost the art of debate. We've lost the art of arguing out of respect. You know, we can all have our opinions, but even as we have our opinions and we believe in them strongly, we need to extend courtesy and respect and consideration to the other side. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean that we have to be convinced, but we at least need to hear the other side out with respect and with understanding that they're also human beings. They're not evil. They they have a cogent argument. We might not agree with the argument, and we have might have a counter-argument, but that doesn't mean we can't extend proper respect. Right. And this is the kind of art that has been absolutely lost in the, you know, in the past decade or so. And in Israel, we have just went through four rounds of elections, and we still don't have a government, and we still cannot agree on how to run this country. And every succeeding 
uh, elections have been more and more polarizing. So we are in major need of upgrading our mutual respect in this country and in other countries too, but certainly in Israel. And I think Rabbi Shimon says, you know, go get your act together and then come back to me. Um, and that's what God is telling us to win. And, you know, it's easy to say, oh, the elections and everybody's disrespectful of all these parties. No, that really stresses every single one of us. Every single one of us has a long way to go to upgrade how we treat other people. And th- when we see a tragedy like this, if a tragedy like this touches you and if it makes you sad, it's because you have a connection to it. Because otherwise God wouldn't have shown it to you. Otherwise God wouldn't have made you care. God only makes us care about things that are relevant to us. So if God makes you care and God makes it painful for you to watch this, then there is something in you that you have to upgrade, you have to fix, you have to improve. And giving mutual respect to other people, especially people you don't agree with, would be a good first place to start. Yes, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you know, I think I can think of a few different things that are pulling people apart into um, intolerable places. And that is, of course, I, I mean, I think most recently I can think of, you know, whether you're a Trump supporter or not, you're, uh, you were ostracized, you weren't listened to. And uh, so there has to be more tolerance there. You listen to those who support Biden. You can uh, uh, appreciate their opinions. You don't have to agree with it. But to be uh, to be tolerant, to be able to listen, and and you can still keep your opinion, but just to have that courtesy. It's, it's basically decency and common courtesy. And then there's also the vaccine question, which has uh, also divided people uh, also in uh, very big fits of anger. Are you vaccinated? Are you not vaccinated? Uh, should you get, should you not get? And I'm talking about both sides, by the way. So we need to be able to say, uh, this is my stance. This is what I believe and why. And if the other person wants to share their reasons why they believe the op in there and they, they are in the opposite camp, we need to listen to them and say, we hear you. Uh, I, I understand you. I even appreciate your opinion. I still don't agree with it. Or maybe you've convinced me. I don't know. But to have that decency and that common courtesy and that Ahavat Yisrael or love for your fellow Jew or just love for your fellow brother or sister uh, all over mankind. That's very true. And you know what? We think that when we have a debate, when we have an argument, the point is to convince the other side. And that's just not necessarily so. And if we look back at Rabbi Shimon and his colleagues, the people who are mentioned throughout the Talmud, what you will notice is for the past 2,000 years, 1,500 years, Jews have the Talmud and just have been learning the Talmud. And the Talmud doesn't bring down the bottom line. The Talmud usually brings, you know, this rabbi says this, and this rabbi says this, and this is the reasons for Rabbi A, and this is the reasons for Rabbi Y, and they argue it out. And sometimes there's a bottom line, and sometimes there is no bottom line. So usually there is a bottom line. So the question is then, why does the Talmud keep bringing all these rabbis? Just give us the bottom line. No, there is value to both opinions, and the, in Jewish law, there will be times when something happens or something out of ordinary happens, and we will go back to the opinion, the dissenting opinion. So there is there is value to both opinions. Is the point is not to um, to convince each other. The point is to see both opinions because there can be circumstances where you will even agree with somebody who disagrees with you. And I've seen that so many times in my life. I have a certain opinion, and other people think differently. But then something will happen, and I will see the value in the other person's side. And maybe I will even agree with them under those circumstances. Mm-hmm. We live in a complex world, and complex world does require a variety of approaches. And it's appreciating this. It's not that the other people are wrong. They just have a different approach. And that approach may work sometimes. And there might be some redeeming value in that. I think that's what we have to to look for. We have to look for the good and the and the and the common denominator, while still believing what we believe in. I'm I'm not saying suggesting giving up on your opinion. I'm not suggesting being being backboneless. But if somebody has an approach, there is a redeeming value to it, and there is. There will be circumstances where there will be some. There will be a spark of truth in that argument. Mm-hmm. Where I actually believe in the Torah that there's a spark of truth in every argument, even the wrong arming, 
argument. There's a spark of truth in everything, and it's finding the spark of truth. Amen. And Leah, you see me, it, that's the point. As we, as we go out of this interview, I'm going to quote my wise mother, which I often do on the show, and that is she always says, if everybody thought alike, we'd only need one person in the world. Oh, <laughs> Thank you true. for being with us. Leah Aharoni. We're going to be right Thank back, you, everybody. Don't go anywhere. Hi, everyone. This is Andrea Simento from Jerusalem, inviting you to drop everything and join me on my show, Pull Up a Chair. We'll visit this week's quirky stories, meet fabulous guests, and discover my Israel. Together, we'll laugh, shout, and explain the topics that make us say, hey, we've got to talk about that. So get comfortable and pull up a chair with me, Andrea Simento, every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. All right, we are back here at the Tamar Yona Show on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. And Israel's been uh, been through a ringer the past uh, several days, starting Thursday night at a joyous celebration up north on Mount Meron for the Lagba Omer holiday. 45 people killed, up to 150 people injured, uh, a huge blow to the country. And on Sunday, a drive-by shooting attack in which three yeshiva students waiting at a bus stop were uh, shot and uh, critically injured. We uh, don't know if it was one terrorist driving who pulled out a gun and shot these boys at the bus stop, or if it was a driver and a shooter. And the IDF is combing the area. We believe that these, th- this, this or these terrorists will be found. It's just a matter of time. And uh, we are hoping that this will be ended uh, as soon as possible in order to protect other people. All right, so let me just read a few news headlines. We're going to cover both of these stories of what happened in Maron and also the shooting attack. I'm going to Arucheva now, and they say that the Hamas terror organization praises the perpetrators of attack in Samaria. It says the Hamas on Sunday responded with great satisfaction to the attack at the Tapuach Junction in Samaria in which three students from the Itamar Yeshiva were injured. During the attack, IDF soldiers responded by firing at the vehicle of the terrorists who fled the scene. Hamas welcomed what they defined as, quote, the heroic action in Zatara carried out by the heroes, they say, of our people's muhajidin against the herds of the settlers and in the heart of the Zatara military checkpoint where a force of the occupation army is stationed. This is what the Hamas is saying. You know, that's like people in America, let's say, and some organization, BLM, would be praising murderers uh, who went out and shot innocent people waiting at a bus stop. They're not ashamed even, but they're terrorists. The heroic message of Operation Zatara, they say, is clear to the occupation army and the leaders of the enemy. That's Israel. And that is that rifle that our people's heroes carry is ready to defend Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa. The hand of our heroic people is still on the trigger, and it is he who protects his rights in in his country and in the holy places. Hamas also called for an escalation of the resistance against Israel as the end of Ramadan approaches. So the Islamic holiday of Ramadan, again, uh, any excuse they can use to kill Jews, And this is often happening on their Ramadan holiday. All right. uh, Let me just see if there's anything else uh, on this news story. And then we're going to go. Let's uh, read something here. Three Yeshiva students wounded in terrorist shooting near 
an Israeli town in Samaria. A shooting was reported in central Samaria Sunday afternoon outside of the Israeli town of Kfar Tapuach. Initial reports indicate that the attack was carried out by terrorists firing from a vehicle as it drove by Tapuach Junction. The shots were fired at Israeli civilians waiting at a bus stop. The Israeli emergency services, MADA, reported that three people, all said to be in their 20s, were wounded in this shooting terrorist attack. The United Hatsala, which is also an emergency first responders, uh, were dispatched to the scene, as well as MADA, of course, the Magen David Odom, in order to assist IDF medical teams in treating the wounded and evacuate them to hospitals for further treatment. Two of the wounded are said to be unconscious. Un- unconscious. Now, as of this morning, I can say that uh, the latest reports is one is in very, very critical condition and uh, may lose their lives. We are praying for him uh, very hard and for the other victims as well. Another one is in very serious condition, and another one, I believe, uh, was just released from the hospital and he was released home. The victims have been identified as yeshiva students from the nearby town of Itamar. And uh, the attack took place at 5.54 p.m. Sunday afternoon here in Israel. The IDF is currently in pursuit of the terrorist or terrorists who fled the scene in their vehicle immediately after the shooting. At the time of the attack, IDF soldiers returned fire at the terrorist vehicle. So that's the story of what happened on Sunday in Israel. All right. Uh, we're going to look now at some more eyewitness accounts at what happened in Miron. And again, I want to preface this with this is uh, an eyewitness account. It is with opinion. It is not uh, proven everything to be factual yet, but we need to hear what people are saying, and then you can come to your own conclusion, or uh, please God, we should have more a- more answers and more real facts so we can make a better judgment in the coming days. So it says here, this is from Arutsheva, police came to the Maron uh, ceremony and to... Uh, the, the police that were there in order to ensure safety, uh, this eyewitness says police came with fire in their eyes. The Hasidim who were at the Maron deadly disaster blamed the police for the incident in which 45 people were killed. This is what this report says. David, a Hasid, he's a religious man, who arrived in B'nai Brak, that's a city adjacent to Tel Aviv, today from Maron, harshly criticized the conduct of the police, of the Israeli police, in which he claimed uh, led to the disaster in Maron in which 45 people were killed. Quote, the celebration at Maron has been going on for more than a century, every year. It is impossible to say that the very existence, the existence of the event is what brought about this disaster, David noted in his opening remarks. In recent years, we see that the police have decided that they are going to put an end to this event. They have decided to harass those whom attend the event to make trouble. They arrived as early as noon. They sprayed tear gas. They made snake tracks. You could feel in the air that something was going to happen, he claimed. He goes on and says, it may have been necessary for a physical usher, someone of ours, meaning instead of having police ushering people where to go, he says, he's suggesting that maybe it's better to have uh, Haredi volunteers doing this or, or Haredi workers doing this, to technically say, come in or do not come in into the areas where people, the crowd controls need to be taking place. He says, when a policeman sees a Haredi person, he enters a certain frame of mind where instead of yes or no, it is suddenly tear gas. Just as Haredi ushers do not come to supervise football events, because football events is usually where the secular Jews, and and there'll there'll be religious Jews there too, but it's more of a secular uh, event. 
And everyone understands the same thing that at the Hilula of the Rashbi, uh, again, this, this is what the celebrations at Meron, where there shouldn't uh, be secular policemen who do not have any idea what is going on or how things should be. So basically what he's saying here is that the people who are policing the area or who should be ushering people and the crowds to certain areas, he's saying it shouldn't be the police. It should be people who are sensitive and understand why this event is taking place and someone who can identify with the people there. That's what he's claiming and saying. Menachem, a chassid from Sfat, that's a city up in northern Israel, told of a violent clash he had with police not long before the disaster and claimed the police who secured the incident, quote, came here with fire in their eyes, unquote. He says, my nephews saw policemen standing there or standing here a minute before the incident, Menachem added, blaming the police for the disaster. As soon as it became crowded, people started to leave. There was nothing out of the ordinary. People shouldn't say, this is from heaven. There was murder here, he says. I don't know whether it was malicious or accidental. I do not judge anyone. For that, there are the professionals to decide. But we don't understand why the police who were here are not being detained until the end of the proceedings. If I had been involved in an accident in any way, I would have been arrested until the end of the proceedings. So here we have a situation of uh, Haredi Jews who are at a, an event uh, that was a religious event, a very spiritual event, and they were being policed by people that they say either had an agenda or don't understand them, and that this could have been done better. Um, some of the the claims here are even uh, more, uh, we say in Hebrew, harif, or very more spicy, more cutting, saying that the police had fire in their eyes, that the police perhaps were uh, had an agenda, they wanted to um, make it a not nice event, so in order to maybe convince people that it's not worth going to because they're not going to have a good time. So we're going to hopefully in the next several days find out exactly uh, in a more clear way what exactly happened and come to the right conclusions and the needed conclusions in order that something like this should never happen again. When we get back, the Knesset and the government and the coalition, what are the possibilities? We'll be right back. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. Hello, I am Walter Bingham. If you want to hear the news behind the news and the true perspective on world affairs, then the Walter Bingham File is the program for you. We bring you interviews with the movers and shakers, political commentaries, and on-the-spot reports of events as they happen. All here every Tuesday, 4 p.m. Israel Time, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. And it's all archived on our website. Make it a date. You're listening to the Tamar Yona Show here at Israel News Talk Radio. Well, we are after our fourth elections inside of two years, and still we don't have a government. All the coalition talks are going on. The present Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, is trying to keep his chair. He is negotiating and negotiating and trying to get some type of coalition under his belt in order to be able to present to the president of Israel. At the same time, the opposition, which is led by Yair Lapid, 
And uh, there are other people who are also perhaps even right wing, but do not want to see Bibi or Benjamin Netanyahu continue as the prime minister. So there are negotiations and possible negotiations as well to form a government. So what exactly is happening? What might we expect? We're going to be speaking now with Jeremy Sultan. Jeremy Sultan is a Knesset insider, political and poll analyst at www.knessetjeremy.com. He is a member of the Yamina party. He's quite busy now, also working for his party uh, as they try to negotiate deals in order to try to form some type of government. Welcome to the show, Jeremy Sultan. All right. So there's a lot of talking going on uh, of people trying to make a coalition. Bibi has just a a number of days until he until the the baton passes over. And uh, it, it looks like he's not being so successful. The Arab Party is holding a lot of weight here who they're going to support. So we're really in a a very unsure unpredictable place when it comes to the possible next government. Where do you see things going? Yes, well, um, you know, the the 28 days ends on uh, Tuesday, which will be uh, tomorrow, I guess. And, um, you you know, that's that's a big question of what's going to happen then. But there are three things that could happen before Netanyahu's mandate ends. And the first thing, of course, is for Netanyahu to, to propose a government for something like that to happen. So that would obviously mean that there were secret talks that nobody knew about and everyone is surprised. And uh, I think a majority of people would say that even if there are such talks going on, that it's very unlikely that we'll see anything like that happen. Uh, Of course, uh, with Sunday being a uh, Memorial Day for for, uh, those who who fell in um, uh, on Lag Bomer. So, you know, it's probably not the day to go ahead and, and announce anything like that but one would expect that something like that would come out today. Uh, A second option is that Netanyahu is able to get what he's been seeking, which is 61 votes to vote for the direct prime minister law. Um, For whatever reason, he thinks that this will be able to help him. Of course, that does not change the um, composition of the current Knesset or provide him a coalition or an ability to pass the state budget or an ability to stop us from a future election. But this is the second thing that could happen before he ends his mandate. But would that be retroactive if he's able to pass something like that for the prime minister? I mean, technically, if it were to go in now, it, mean, it would mean he doesn't care who makes the coalition. He's still going to be the prime minister. But that's only if it's retro- retroactively. Is it? Would it be? So so again, you know, uh, the, one of the problems that we have with uh, Israeli law, you know, without having a formal constitution is that we really, you know, if we have a, a absolute majority, you're able to really do a lot of things. So if he would be able to get over 61 MKs, he would be able to go ahead and create a special direct election without a Knesset election. For this to happen, he needs not just the 52 MKs that supported him in the president's residence when it came to getting his prime minister nomination. He would have to convince both Bennett and Abbas uh, to support this initiative. Neither of them have said that they're looking to do so. so. So again, you have a situation where either Netanyahu is able to propose a government which is not something we're expecting to see. We have a situation where he can pass the direct elections um, bill, which does, again, it just does not seem like he has a legis- he has the majority to pass that legislation now. But uh, with Netanyahu and uh, pulling rabbits out of hats, it's never worth um, you know going over and, and ignoring a possibility. It's important to put all of them out there. And uh, of course, the third, which is uh, the the most likely scenario, is that he gets to the end of his um, mandate without being able to propose and without being able to legislate something else. And uh, if that happens, then uh, it goes, the ball goes back to President Rivlin and it's in his court. And then he has four options in terms of what he can do. The first is to extend Netanyahu's mandate. Very few people expect that to happen. But again, if Netanyahu the magician is able to, <laughs> that's one of the things that can happen. A second thing that Rivlin can do, and he's indicated that he might do this, is give up on giving the chance to somebody else to be able to form a mandate and to throw uh, away the possibility of a second mandate. The second mandate means giving someone else a chance other than Netanyahu to be able to form a coalition. And by doing so, he would throw it over the Knesset. The Knesset would have 21 days to be able to find uh, 61 signatures 
to be able to um, really rally around a candidate that could then get what's known as the Knesset mandate. Uh, but, but it does not look good because it does not look like anyone would have a majority to be able to do that. The third option is that he does, as he did in previous times, look at who finished second place in terms of nominations. That was Yair Lapid and give that mandate over to him. And the fourth one, which, which is a very interesting option, uh, this time we had three candidates uh, for prime minister in the president's residence. And that opens up a fourth option for Reveling, which is to do a second round of consultations since whoever has the first mandate is not allowed to get the second mandate. And that would mean that uh, people would have to choose between Bennett and Lapid, or perhaps the Likud would put up a different candidate other than Netanyahu. So again, if, if we had that fourth option of new consultations, it's very difficult to know what happens but it is very likely that that is the direction that Reveling is going to go in. And that means that there'll be a lot more uh, people trying to figure out what's happening in the coming days. All right. Now you're in Bennett's party in Yamina. Um, what would be the best scenario for your party? Well, I think uh, the last scenario of going to consultations is not just best for Naftali Bennett, which of course gives him the best chance to be able to form a uh, government for himself. But, but it's also best for the country in terms of being able to prevent another election. Um, like I said, if Netanyahu had an ability to be able to form a coalition, most likely Reveling would go ahead and extend the mandate. We're not expecting that to happen. I think Reveling giving up on a chance for a second person to get a crack at forming a coalition is not a responsible thing to do when there is a chance to give it to someone else. It's possible to give it to Lapid, but if we paid attention to what we saw during the first round of consultations, it was clear that Lapid got more disqualifications than he got um, nominations for prime minister. And it's clear that over 61 of the MKs are not looking to uh, go ahead and move forward in a coalition where he is at the head of it. So really the only chance that we get something, whether it's Bennett or someone else from the Likud or some other creative solution is for Reveling to bring in all of the parties again. There were 13 lists that were elected in this Knesset compared to eight lists in the last election. And to hear all 13 to see who they choose to nominate and open up the process to see what we can do in terms of hopefully ending this political deadlock after, of course, four elections in two years and the possibility of a fifth. Mm. So is there a chance that somehow they can change the way that we vote and in the government so we don't get into these four elections in two years? Yeah, I mean, there, there's always a, a chance to see legislation that changes the system. Uh, if we're looking at recent reforms that have done, been done in terms of uh, electoral law, of course, raising the threshold to 3.25%, which is roughly four seats that was done in 2014, is the most significant uh, of the electoral forms, but there were plenty of other things that were done over the years in terms of uh, election campaign fu funding, in terms of uh, no confidence motions that are that are meant, to, you know, it's very difficult now, not only is it constructive, but in order to replace a sitting government once it's established within the Knesset, you have to be able to uh, present not just an alternative prime minister, but also the entire cabinet with all the ministers in it. So, you know, there are a lot of things that have been done to try to create a more stable uh, Knesset, a more stable government. Of course, sanctions against people who uh, decide to leave their party, not allowing them to run um, in um, existing lists in the Knesset in the next election and so on and so forth. There's no shortage of different things that have been tried. A lot of them have been passed. That's not helped us. Again, you, you know, we mentioned the idea of direct elections, which a lot of people think is a perfect um, you know, outcome to this situation. We tried that three times in the past, in 96 and 99, and in 2001. In uh, each three of those cases, you had a uh, situation where the largest party was not the party that was, um, that was governing. Um, and in, in each one of those cases, it was the second largest party that, uh, that was running uh, the government. So yeah, I, I, I don't know if, if we can say there's anything that's a magic fit. What I can tell you is we've tried a lot of things. There's a lot of trial and error. Some of the stuff have been a bit more successful. A lot of them have, have definitely caused even bigger problems. So I, I don't know if we can definitely go to the legislative route to hopefully bring uh, some sort of resolution to the situation we're in. Perhaps what we need again is uh, a, a situation where we have 
people thinking outside of the box and willing perhaps to create a government that has a very, very rigid amount of things that they're willing to do. Uh, more of a technocrat type government, a lot less political, being willing to put a lot of the um, differences that we have to the side. And uh, if we don't do that, and everyone, of course, sticks to their guns and their convictions and uh, uh, remains very determined. And of course, I, I understand that, you know, every politician wants to go ahead and make sure that they're taking care of 100% of the concerns of their constituency. If we're in that position, though, I, I think we, we might be doomed to keep doing this over and over again. So do you think that Bennett will sit, is there, is there any chance that Bennett will sit with BB in a government? I think, uh, I think there is a chance. I think uh, we should remember that he did go ahead and, and sit with Netanyahu five times before. He tried. It was Netanyahu that decided to stop sitting with him. And that's, of course, his choice. Hmm. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on with us, Jeremy Sultan from the Amina Party. Thank you and good luck and good luck to all of the nation of Israel and having and forming finally a stable government here. Thank you. Thank you, Tamaria. Hopefully we'll be able to do it with God's help. Amen. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. If you're hearing this message, everyone else can too. Advertise with Israel News Talk Radio and get your message out to people. We'll build a personalized package for you. Contact advertising at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, this is Jake in Anchorage, Alaska, and I love listening to all the super interesting interviews and up-to-date information on what's happening in Israel. Hello, this is Anna King, originally from London, now living in Israel. And what can I say? Israel News Talk Radio is my cup of tea. My name is Bhaskar. I'm from India, and I love listening because you get to know the truth and wonderful voices from this lovely country. Mom! Okay, wait a minute. Hi, this is Chava Dax, and I'm calling for the rolling hills of Malaya Dumim, just north of Jerusalem. I always listen to Israel News Talk Radio to get all the latest news and commentary and to keep me up to date every day. This is Sarah Dax from Malaya Dumim, and I'm 12. I wish Israel News Talk Radio was boring so my mom wouldn't listen to it all the time. Mom! You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.